It's maybe the most disliked book of the Bible, not just by skeptics, but by Christians too. But why? That's right. We are tackling bloody rituals, rules about sexuality, and all that comes with the book of Leviticus. Why are there so many rules about what to sacrifice and how? How do we know which rules were for the people thousands of years ago and which are the ones for us today? Does this ancient text that some say justifies sexism or advocates for slavery actually have anything to offer us in our modern journeys of faith? We're going to be talking about all of that and more on today's episode of Theology on Air. Well, welcome back to Theology on Air. Uh, I am Sarah Stone, the Outreach Director for Young Adults at Memorial Drive Presbyterian Church on the west side of Houston, joined as usual by my co-producer and pastor at First Lutheran in Midtown Houston. And we are joined today by a very special guest, someone that I've been reading and listening to for years, Paul Copan, coming to us from sunny Florida. That's actually where he is right now. No, I'm kidding. That's a virtual background. But uh, Paul Copan has a PhD in philosophy from Marquette University, and he is the Pledger Family Chair of Philosophy and Ethics at Palm Beach Atlantic University in West Palm Beach, Florida. He is the author or editor of 40 books plus, including Is God a Moral Monster and a little book for new philosophers. And also just a fun little note. I think he went to the same seminary that I did. Did you go to uh, Trinity up in Chicago? I did indeed. So we're the same person, basically. Right. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Great to be with you, too. And uh, looking forward to our conversation. Yeah. Good. So uh, just for those of you checking Theology on Air out, maybe for the first time, this was born out of a ministry called Theology on Tap here in Houston, where we get a bunch of young adults together to drink craft beer and talk about interesting topics around faith, religion, philosophy, theology, um, culture, that kind of thing. Um, and we started the podcast in 2020 to be able to kind of go deeper into that. And we are wanting to do one episode a month where we actually just dive into the Bible. What does it actually say? What does it mean? How can we understand the tricky stuff? Um, and Paul is an expert on lots of things, but especially some of the weird stuff in the old Testament. So that is why we asked him to join us for Leviticus today. So Paul, maybe just start by telling us, uh, before we dive into like, you know, cutting open animals and things like that, just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this kind of thing. Like you tackle some really difficult topics in your books and your talks. How did that come to be? Well, I've always had an interest in scripture. I grew up in a pastor's home and I have an undergrad in biblical studies and a master divinity degree uh, in addition to my philosophy degrees. And so I've always seen the interplay of theology, philosophy, or studies, and philosophy uh, as being very important. And so as I have been engaged with some of these difficult texts, uh, I guess what kind of launched me into this more seriously was the result of the new atheists uh, after mm -hmm. September 11th that they were writing against the Old Testament God. And of course, you're probably familiar with Richard Dawkins' famous mm -hmm. uh, litany of uh, descriptions of the God of the Old Testament. And so I actually was reading these new atheists and ended up writing an article in response to them uh, entitled, Is Yahweh a Moral Monster? Uh, which eventually turned into a book, Is God a Moral Monster? And then Matt Flanagan uh, joined me in the theme of violence in the Old Testament. We did a, a book called Did God Really Command Genocide? Mm -hmm. And I'm actually working on another book called Is God a Vindictive Bully, which is a supplement to uh, Is God a Moral Monster? So I'm finishing that book up uh, August 1st and uh, going from there. So it's been something that I've been very interested in. My wife says, Boy, Paul, you tackle all these kind of rough and tumble topics, sometimes very gruesome and uh, and violent. I, I'm, I'm, she says you're such a, vi a mild mannered guy, and you're Aww. tackling some of these tough uh, tough things. But I, I find it important and uh, want to help people wrestle with these things. And I'm, I'm just trying to bring forward some things that I found helpful in my own thinking, my own spiritual life, uh, my own intellectual wrestlings. Uh, and yeah. some presenting those things to others as they are also grappling with them. Well, I really appreciate it because I engage a lot of people that are on the outside of faith looking in. Uh, so atheists and agnostics, skeptics, people that have been hurt by the church or maybe new believers and the kinds of things that you talk about in, I mean, I've got 
both of those books and more of yours on my shelf and I have read them um, because you're tackling the kind of questions they have. Like, well, how could I serve a God that, you know, would allow such violence and say the conquest? And we're going to cover more conquest stuff in a subsequent episode. But um, I love that you do that because you offer answers that kind of can make you scratch your head and go, oh, okay, so God can be good. And all these things can have happened, but I, you know, I'm not going to spoil the ending. Y'all have to go and buy those books to see, to see how he explains it all. But, um, today Leviticus. So we are in the third book of the Bible. We've tackled Genesis Exodus, and we find ourselves here in Leviticus, maybe just tee us off with like, what, what's happening as we come into Leviticus, what's the point of the book, what's happening with the Israelites, why is this book in the Bible? What's kind of the overarching God was like, this is a good idea to put in the hands of the Israelites. Well, of course, the book of Leviticus <clears throat> comes within the context of a broader uh, narrative of the workings of God with the patriarchs, the nation of Israel, its formation, uh, and beyond. And so uh, you have in the middle of this, this big bag of law uh, mm -hmm. dropped into this narrative. And, and, and how does that fit in? Well, of course, uh, you, as you covered in Exodus, there is the uh, Mount Sinai and God giving the law, the 10 words. Uh, you have a rebellion uh, with, with Aaron who makes the golden calf. Uh, and then there is judgment that comes. So basically, as in response to the, that act of idolatry, uh, there is then a priestly code that goes from, uh, you know, that portion of Exodus uh, on into Leviticus. And then in Leviticus 17, there is the people, it, not just, so you have Aaron doing his idolatrous deed, and then you have the people uh, engaging in Leviticus 17 in these goat, with these goat idols. And hmm. so there is then a subsequent uh, legislation for the people in, Ex in Leviticus 17 into the end of the book in chapter 27. So you have the priestly dimension as the first part of Leviticus, uh, spilling over from the end of Exodus, which talks about the tabernacle and so forth, uh, and into spilling into Leviticus, which then brings that priestly dimension, the first 16 chapters, and then the 17th through the 27th chapters, dealing with the people's responsibilities uh, before God. So that's the general breakdown uh, and kind of it, you know, following the flow uh, from Exodus. So it almost seems like this book is in response to what people are doing anyway. And God's like, no, 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 no. Let me, let me frame this up for you. What you need to know about what to do on these fronts. Um, I think just like we did with Exodus, I think I kind of just want to go through the book. I've just gone through and kind of outlined the themes that we find, because, you know, we don't want to start with the weird sexual code before we talk about what animals to cut up and open. So naturally, naturally. So it starts by talking about offerings that people can make. Um, uh, so, I mean, the first question I think a lot of people have is maybe understanding the differences between the different kinds of offerings. There's like guilt offerings and sin offerings, and then you have grains and first fruits then there's animals dying. So I don't know if maybe you can kind of give us a system to understand the different kinds of offerings, why God had so many. Um, and they're not all covering sin. I mean, we'll get into that a little bit later, but maybe just walk us through some of the, the offerings that we see in that first part. And those poor animals, do we feel sorry for them? I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, a load of, load of questions. I know uh, it's like 16 <laughs> questions in one. Yeah, yeah. So as I said, you know, the first part of Leviticus deals with like, you know, the first 17 chapters dealing with the Levitical priestly dimensions. And then beyond that, uh, really more, more technically, chapter 18, after the sin of the Israelites uh, in the goat idols, uh, then you have the sins related to sexuality and you know, laws related to sexuality and so forth. So I know we'll cover some of those things. So, but when it comes to those sacrifices, that first, you know, the first few chapters of Leviticus, uh, I think it's helpful to understand first and foremost, that God is more interested in the heart condition of his people, that God sometimes mm. will say, I hate your meaning, your festivals, your meaningless sacrifices, like Amos chapter five, uh, or God's desiring in, in Psalm 51, he desires a broken and contrite heart, that mm -hmm. this is ultimately what he is looking for. And so these, these, these rituals, these ceremonies, 
are to reflect the heart of the people. Uh, so it's important that it's not just seen as a, just a bunch of rituals, but actually that there is a heart behind it and the, these rituals represent something. So you have, first of all, the burnt offering, which is actually the, the entire animal is burned, mm. except the hide could go to, to the priests, uh, that this was part of a payment, uh, as it were, to, to the priests. And this is to show, uh, you know, of course, a way to honor God, you know, that the animals were to be without blemish, without, uh, without any defect. Uh, and so you, you shouldn't go before God in an unthinking way. You should be careful about what you bring to God. And as Malachi uh, talks about, you know, you don't want to bring God a defective animal. Uh, would you do that for your governor? No, of course not. And so God is to be honored in these sacrifices. And so mm -hmm. that animal is reflecting kind of a, a uh, to God. Uh, and, and it's also reflecting a substitutionary sacrifice that in, in some of these animal sacrifices, they would put her hands on the animal, it, it, it basically showing that the what what the worshippers' sins are being basically transferred to the animal and representing the animal's death as being in the place of the worshiper. Basically, the worshiper is saying, I deserve to die, but this animal is dying in my place. So that burnt offering is that, uh, you know, that kind of first and full representation rep of atonement being made. Let me uh, pause you system. just for a second yeah. there. So if they're putting their hands on the animal and I mean, sort of the fancy word right there, right, is imputing. They're saying the sins or the, the bad things that you have done that deserve this are going to go to the animal and the animal will, as a substitute, die. Um, I mean, that's obviously pre foreshadowing, prefiguring what happened on the cross, right? right. Christ, our, it's not just that Christ's righteousness is imputed to us, that happens, but our sins are imputed to him and then he dies in our place in the same way, right? Yeah, of course, this is the sacrifice of Christ is once for all, he's both our, the, sacri the sacrificial victim, as it were, of course, he voluntarily lays down his life, but also is our high priest too. So you see a, mm. a merging of images here that he fulfills both the sacrificial system, fulfills that high priestly role uh, on our behalf, representing us before God. So, so yes, there is, but there is a, the Old Testament system is, of course, inadequate because you have to repeat it year after year, right. uh, day after day, et cetera. So the book of Hebrews highlights that Jesus' sacrifice is, is once and for all. Now, I don't know if that gets to where you no. wanted to go on this, but it is. No, it, and, and I want to continue with the sacrifices. The only reason I brought it up is because. I think a lot of people think I don't need to pay attention to all this crazy stuff in Leviticus. All that matters is Jesus. Right. And so I think this is one of those situations where it's like, well, to really understand what was happening with Jesus, you could have so much more insight and depth of understanding. If we go back and we see how it all started in Leviticus, that's all I, I didn't want to yeah, take gotcha. away from you continuing. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and there's a great enrichment in our own study of Leviticus uh, of what these, you know, you know, just even things like, the extreme care that was given, especially on the part of the mm -hmm. priests, as they would come before God, that this is one, a privilege, but also that one had to be very careful about how one approached God, that this wasn't a casual sort of thing. And, uh, and it's a reminder that even as we come, as Hebrews chapter four says, even as we come boldly before the throne of grace, uh, we need to understand that we are also, uh, this is not something that we simply take for granted, but this is something that Christ has come to remove those barriers, uh, that he has removed those obstructions that we can come fully and freely to God. So there's a, a great privilege, also a great responsibility that we need to be uh, taking into account look at the, uh, the sacrificial system and, of course, its fulfillment in Christ. Um, yeah. Okay, so th there's, the, there's the burnt offering. There's also the, the grain offering that comes. It's a gift of grain that is offered to the Lord and sometimes accompanies other offerings like the drink offerings and, and so forth and has a two, kind of a twofold emphasis where there is a first fruits that is given, kind of the whole grains that are given uh, as part of that but also there, there was a kind of the human component of the kind of the gratitude expressed through the grinding up of that grain into flour, kind of the product of human hands that is also sacrificed. So, so basically this, this flour that was offered, it wasn't the whole, you know, just a whole bunch of it. It was just a handful of flour that was burned on the altar. And then the rest of this cereal or grain offering was then given to the priests, you know, the priest family and so forth, uh, to, to benefit from the 
the overflow of the Israelite community's uh, Know, hard work in the fields uh, and their bounty. And so this would come in the, in the, in the form of flour, cakes, and so forth that were, that were presented to, to the priests. So that was the, that was the grain offering. So there is something going on here uh, in terms of the, you know, the sharing in the offering that the priests, keep in mind that the, the, the priests and the Levites did not have their own territory. They lived in, in various tribal lands, and so they were benefiting from the work, the generosity of the people who lived in these tribal lands who owned ter territory. And so this was a way of be incorporating the priests uh, and their families, the Levites, into this community uh, that they share in the bounty of the Israelites uh, in, in this way. Uh, so that's the, that's the grain offering. There's also, we can talk about the fellowship offering, sometimes called the peace offering. Uh, it's related to the word shalom uh, or peace, which could be a free will offering, a, kind of a thanksgiving offering, kind of, kind of a general offering uh, of gratitude, of celebration within Israel. Uh, and this involved meat that was, uh, was shared between the priest and also the worshiper, that both the priest and the worshiper could eat from that. So the priest would receive the breast uh, and the, the right thigh uh, of the animal, uh, the right thigh of the animal, whether it was the front or the rear, we're not told, but probably the front uh, thigh, uh, right thigh, and then the worshiper received the rest of that and could could eat that. So it was a again a way of sharing with the priestly family, uh, with the priests and Levites, uh, but also the worshiper also enjoyed that uh, in that fellowship offering. Um, there's the sin offering, uh, which was, deals with unintentional sins uh, that is due to, say, human weakness or failure. Um, and so this was kind of a, seen as more like a purification for the whole worship area, that God dwelling in the midst of Israel, dwelling in the, in the you know, locally, localized in the tabernacle, uh, that this was a kind of a, a way of symbolizing the purification of that whole area for those unintentional sins so that Israel could maintain that ongoing fellowship and harmony with God uh, without the interruption of ceremonial uh, moral impurity and so forth. Sometimes this could even be could cover also, say, skin diseases or uh, ritual impurity after uh, childbirth uh, for, a, for a woman. Um, and then, then finally, you have the, the guilt offering that is, that is also uh, involving someone who has been wronged. This is sometimes called a restitution offering, uh, which involves not only a sacrifice, but also any reparations, material reparations to be given to someone in the Israelite community if you have maybe done something wrong legally or you have uh, stolen from someone, uh, that this is an opportunity to make reparations, to make restitution. Uh, and Jesus is alluding to this in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount where he says, if any of you uh, is going to offer your gift at the altar, first go and be reconciled to your mm -hmm. brother if he has something against you, and then offer your gift. So there is that picture that is presented in uh, even in the Sermon on the Mount uh, that gives. So that's why it's important to study Leviticus. Uh, you yeah. have the backdrop here to know what is going on, what these uh, what these offerings are symbolizing. We have, you know, in the New Testament, there's the symbol of the burnt offering in, in Romans chapter 12, that we are to present our bodies as living sacrifices. This is a picture of uh, the totality of sacrifice, the burnt offering being consumed wholly uh, in the presence of God. So again, there are a number of other things we can come back to, but that lays out, kind of the, gives a general sketch uh, of what we're talking about there. Can I ask a question about the, the priests themselves? Uh, yeah. the, the, the word Leviticus comes from the tribe of Levi. So these were right. Levites. Um, mm -hmm. And so they were Levitical priests, I guess we'd say. Um, it's kind of weird that that one of the 12 tribes is just like, hey, you're the priests. <laughs> you know, we think of religious leaders as people called into the ministry mm -hmm. and, you know, right. and not not just one family. So it's kind of like, oh, sorry, kid, you were born a Levite, you know, like, sorry for you, but you have to go be a priest. I mean, we're did they did they perform a role of sort of spiritual you know shepherding yeah shepherding or was it just they slaughtered animals all day you know yeah well of course the there's there's something broader than that of course are going to be involved in the ceremonies and so forth. The Levites are often involved more generally in the upkeep of the tabernacle, the furnishings and so forth that that they they do play a a part in that. Um, you also have, you know, in this uh, in in this arrangement, 
that the, the priests are also, you know, again, part of the Levite uh, tr le tribe of Levi, that they are instructed, they're told to first exemplify what it means to differentiate between the clean and the unclean, between the holy and the common. So they're to live these exemplary lives. And so that's why you'd have, for example, priests, you know, the high priest was to, the priests were to be, uh, when it came to marriage, a priest, you know, Leviticus 21, 14 talks about how a priest is to marry someone who is a virgin, cannot marry someone who is divorced or a widow. Now, under ordinary circumstances, marrying a widow or maybe potentially even someone who is divorced, uh, you know, on, on proper grounds could be, could remarry. Uh, but, but, but again, there is a, you know, the priest couldn't drink wine either. There were certain precautions that were made uh, for the priests who were to, again, not that drinking wine is wrong, it's seen as a good thing, a gift from God in the Old Testament, but again, there are just certain precautions that were taken, that there's a, a certain uh, sobriety, a certain uh, set-apartness on the part of the priests within that community. So they're to live that out, to show what it's like to live out the difference between you know, holy and profane and so on. They're there to exemplify that in, in, in terms of how they carried out the, the rituals, the sacrifices, the ceremonies themselves. Also, they're to be teachers within Israel. They were responsible for passing on the, the law uh, and teaching people to know the difference between the sacred and the profane, uh, between the you know the common and the uh, and the holy, and so this is the you know the role that they have to play. They're supposed to exemplify morally as well as uh, didactically uh, what the Israelites what was required of the Israelites, and so they were not to abuse that. And so there's a special judgment uh, on the uh, on the priests, for example, in the Book of Hosea, that uh, that they are feeding on the the sins of the people. Well, they're, basically, they're hoping that the more that the more the, the Israelites sin, the more meat I get for myself. Mm. And so it's seen in kind of crass terms. And so those were, there could be abuses of that. And so the, the priests were often rebuked because they were leading people into sin. They were being bad examples. You think of uh, how the sons of uh, of Eli uh, in early the early portion of 1 Samuel were, uh, again, uh, partaking in this crass way of these offerings and were living immoral lives uh, within the uh, within this uh, tabernacle setting. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what should be happening today too, right? Living this example of showcasing God's holiness, mm -hmm. and teaching. Um, yeah. I want to just ma maybe make the distinctions. There seem like there are a lot of different kinds of sin that people would offer offerings or sacrifices for, right? Like there's like the big bad ones, but then there's actually, we just learned at our, uh, we did a, an event a couple of days ago about the atonement that there actually wasn't an offering you could make to basically make up for something like say murder or idolatry. Right. But so if you have those, so it seems like there's like regular sin, like mm. being mean to somebody or taking something from someone. And then there's like impurity. Well, that's kind of different. And then right. there's different levels of sin, but also if you can't afford a certain kind of offering you can come in. All I know is when I see two turtle doves, I'm like, I think that's my, that's my price point on the sacrificial system. But can you talk a little bit about different kinds of sin and how that might, I don't know if there's any modern day application for that. Sure. Yeah. Well, we, we do see uh, in, you know, a differentiation in say Leviticus four and uh, numbers 15, where there is the difference between, as you noted, unintentional sin, you know, sins related to human failure, uh, human weakness, uh, you know, that, you know, as opposed to a more high-handed direct sin like blasphemy, idolatry, uh, murder. Now, it doesn't mean that there can't be forgiveness. You think of David mm. who engaged in uh, something mm -hmm. very, very much uh, along the lines of High-handed sin, uh, having Uriah, for example, put to death on the on the front lines of the battlefield. Uh, so you, you, there is the potential for that. But I think David recognizes that even those offerings, uh, for, you know, that there there is no sacrifice for those things, and so he recognizes that you know that the blood of you know these these animals, you know, actually could not bring that atonement. What you desire.
ultimately a broken and contrite heart, that that mm -hmm. is ultimately the only way that you can be properly reconciled to God. Uh, that, you know, of course, it's at the heart of all of our worship, you know, that we come with truly repentant hearts. But in the case of those high-handed, heavy you know, sins, there was... You know, there was still the possibility of forgiveness, but it required, uh, again, that humbling of oneself, true repentance, and so forth. And that's what the Apostle Paul found, something that would be, you know, he called himself a blasphemer, uh, but yet he found mercy uh, as well. And we see this in, in New Testament. There is a, of course, mention of an unpardonable sin in the New Testament, and, and there's question whether this is something particular to the time of Jesus during his particular during his special ministry uh, on earth or if this carries over beyond that and I, I do think that it could simply be interpreted as something that is related to what was going on uh, with Jesus that the religious leaders were ascribing to Jesus uh, you know the works done by the spirit but ascribing them to the prince of demons and so Jesus basically is seeing that these religious leaders have gone so far uh, that this is a sin that is they, they've basically hit rock bottom spiritually and morally mm -hmm. uh, and that there is no forgiveness in this life or in the life to come they've just gone past the point mm -hmm. uh, of, of of restoration and so it could simply be that this is unique to the time of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, and that this is, I and mean, of course, you can talk about really any kind of self-separation from God ultimately keeps one from uh, being uh, forever united with God. Uh, as C.S. Lewis said, the door of hell is closed from the inside. So ultimately, our, our wills separate ourselves from God. So but that's more of a general picture, but there could, that sin, the, that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, it could simply be referring to uh, what is going on during the ministry. Did you want to ask your question about whether people in your church should? Yeah. So <laughs> one of the things I've said to people is, so people make, let's say people make an offering, right? They put it in the offering plate, they write a check, whatever it, you know, the church puts it in its bank account and the church uses it for things that theoretically the people sort of you know, want to support like a pastor salary or like, you know, new feeding carpet, the homeless, feeding the homeless, yeah. you know, something good, they, but they get something out of it. Some of the offerings yeah. in Leviticus are burned. They're just burned on the altar, right? Like, isn't there a grain offering that's just burned? Um, and so I've kind of joked, like, if you really want to sacrifice, we should give cash, right? Not, not a check, but give cash, put it on the altar and light it on fire, you know? Uh, that would be a real sacrifice to a holy God. So if you want to come to Evan's church, yeah. it is on Holman Street. Uh -huh. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. So what do you think? Is that a good idea, Paul, if we <laughs> want to really uh, embrace the spirit of sacrifice? Or what What kind of was the point of that in, in all seriousness? Yeah. Was it to sort yeah. of, in, you know, show, I don't know, to, like to trust loss? in God's provision or, you yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, there is obviously a cost to this. And, and let me just back up here too. I, I perhaps I, I did I should have mentioned this too. In the New Testament, going back to you know high-handed sins versus uh, uh, you know unintentional sins, we do see that there are degrees of sin in the New Testament. Uh, the Jews, Jewish leaders, turned Jesus over to the to the, to Pilate, uh, and, and Jesus said in John 19 that they committed the greater sin. Uh, that lust and adultery are both sins, but they're not equally sinful. Uh, that's the point that Jesus is making, or, or hostile anger uh, versus murder. They're both sin, but they're not equally sinful. A lot of people confuse that. They say, oh, all sins are alike. No, they're not. There are degrees of sin. Uh, there's a hierarchy of sin. There are even, what Jesus talks about in the same chapter, uh, greater and lesser commandments. And so that's why you have greater and lesser uh, punishments. So, so there are degrees of punishment, for example, it, Luke 12 talks about in, in this final state of separation or the, the servants who get some, some get minimal beatings, some get uh, more harsh beatings uh, because of their, the level of their knowledge. So there are degrees of, of, of sin, degrees of punishment. Anyway, uh, but going back to this thing you know, about, say, offerings, uh, David, when he was offering a sacrifice, said that he wasn't going to, he wanted to pay for the this threshing floor where he could offer sacrifices because he didn't want to offer something to God that cost him nothing. And you do see, for example, in the burnt offering, that there is a cost involved, that it's basically uh, the, the whole animal is consumed. Uh, that there is, you know, the hide, of course, goes to the to the priest, but basically from the worshiper's point of view, he does not partake in that offering. Other offerings, the worshiper does, uh, you know, the, you know, very, you know, so he will share meat with the priest, uh, that there will be sometimes a great festivity uh, where, where 
all the people get to share in this eating of meat. Um, you will also, you know, so there is some benefit, even the, the, the grain offering, there's basically what's thrown on the fire and burned is a handful of flour that is included in that, but it's not the entirety of the offering. Uh, the rest of it goes to the priest. So, so you do have those sorts of uh, points of differentiation. So there, are, there is a cost to the sacrifice, um, but, it, it, but it's not as though it's, it, it's always fully consumed, hmm. uh, that there is so if some- I take a, If I take a handful of cash out of the offering plate and keep it for myself, that's fine. Oh my gosh, Evan. No, they burn up a dollar and the other 99 goes to, you know, the all priest. the good things. That's me, right? Yeah, well, well, kind of. well I think <laughs> in, the, in the case of the New Testament, there are different kinds of spiritual offerings that we as, as priests, we're kings and priests, mm -hmm. a royal priesthood, a holy nation, First uh, Peter 2 says. And so we are offering a, a, a hope sacrifices that still carry over the spiritual sacrifices. So we think about applying it this way. Our, our whole being is to be given in surrender to God, uh, Romans chapter 12, uh, that burnt offering image. Our bodies given to God in dedication and worship to him, wholly dedicated. Um, we also have in this the, uh, you know, we have the sacrifice of Hebrews 13, Hebrews 13, our good deeds that are also part of our spiritual sacrifices, uh, our praises, mm -hmm. the fruit of our lips, these are also sacrifices. Uh, the giving of gifts to, like, for example, the, the Philippians supported the work of the Apostle Paul, and Paul saw this as a fragrant offering to God. Um, and, and so this is, in Philippians 4, uh, our, our, our gifts that are given are seen as a generous offering to God. They bring benefit to the kingdom. Paul was using this uh, fellowship uh, you know, this kind of offering that the Philippians had given to him uh, as part of his ongoing work to support himself so that he wouldn't be a, have to be a tent maker uh, and keep to, uh, keep to him, you know, to try to fund himself in his ministry. Uh, you also have, you know, even, even the sacrifice of the Gentiles, Paul said in Romans chapter 15, that these were also, you know, these converts that came to Christ from the Gentiles were also seen as an offering uh, up mm. to God. So, so there are a number of different spiritual sacrifices that we as believers, as priests to God now, uh, that we get to participate in. Uh, so there is that kind of carryover. So I wouldn't want to think about it in terms of burning this or that dollar and the rest going to this or that cause, uh, but thinking more, uh, more in terms of what these spiritual sacrifices uh, connote. Yeah, I really like that. Can, can I ask you a quick question? To no. Okay. We have to move on. No, okay. go make it quick. Just, it'll, should we use the word priest today for religious hmm. leaders? Um, I don't think so. The only two priests, um, you know, priesthoods mentioned in the New Testament, of course, Jesus in the, is in the order of Melchizedek, but Jesus is our great high priest. He is our faithful, compassionate high priest, and all believers are seen as mm -hmm. priests. Mm -hmm. So there is no priestly class uh, in terms of clergy. I think that's going backwards into Old Testament times. Hmm, interesting. To restore, we were we were created to be priests uh, and worshipers of God, to rule creation with God as as uh, as co-rulers with God, and also to walk with God uh, as as priests. So there's priestly language even in the very creation story, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And so God meets with humanity, walks with them in the garden, etc. So Christ comes and it says that His atonement made us a king priests to our God, and we will reign upon the earth. So we're all priests. We're all saints. Uh, so, so there's no need for canonization. Uh, we're, we're already <laughs> saints. Uh, and, and so priesthood, sainthood, this is part of our calling as, as God's holy people, that we have been set apart, that we have access to God through worship, that Christ has come to, to fulfill that calling, to live out that, uh, to, to, to restore that, uh, that vocation for humanity that we get to participate in as those who are God's image bearers and now Christ, who is indeed the image of God, uh, into whose image we are being shaped. Okay, so now that we've offended all our Catholic brothers and sisters, uh, Sorry. just no, listen, it's a, it's a great question and we don't really talk about that much. So I'm glad. So the next section in Leviticus, I have to move us on because we have to get to all the juiciest stuff that's at the end. But, um, the next section of course is about priests. We've kind of already talked about what that role is. So re I really just have one question about this next section. Um, I'm trying to go through the book with the lens of someone that's not a believer or really yeah. skeptical about Christianity, what they might say. And there's, you know, there's a lot of sort of broad stuff and then it zeroes in on some stories. And one of the stories it zeroes in on in the section about priests is this Nadab and Abihu. Um, I had like kind of even forgotten that story until I went to a church of Christ church 
they really love that story. The mm-hmm. Nadab and Abihu, there's hymns about it. Mm-hmm. So the story is basically that these sons of Aaron did something wrong with the fire and then God killed them. It's just a few verses in uh, chapter 10. And right. I'm wondering if you can speak to that because I think a lot of people will think, well, that was extreme or that escalated quickly. Good grief. They did it a little bit wrong. Why is God so mad? Uh, they didn't do it a little bit wrong. Uh, <laughs> actually, this is a pagan ritual that they're introducing into oh, Yahweh snap. worship. So this is, yeah, oh, snap. Uh, the pagan <laughs> ritual of various Western Semitic cults. Um, and so the, you know, associated with one's appointment to the priesthood. So they were bringing in Canaanite pagan rituals into uh, the worship in the tabernacle. You know and no. uh, no. so Rick, okay. Rick Hess, an Old Testament scholar, at, yeah. uh, has written about this in the Tyndale Bulletin. Um, and so this is why they're struck dead. Basically, it parallels the sin of their father, Aaron, who mm-hmm. created the golden calf. Uh, and of course, led to the uh, the judgment on the Israelites. So, a lot of times with these first kind of these first case sins, these these you know, God is coming down hard on these people for breaking covenant. These are covenant breaking acts, and so there is a severe judgment that is associated with them because they're ba- basically breaking faith with the with the God who made a covenant with them out of His grace, out of His love. Hmm. Man, that's. I had no idea that that was what was happening there, but that I, I changes knew, it. Yeah, I knew it was more than like a oops kind of thing. Right. It was an intentional act. They were told not to do it, and they did it anyway. So, um, yeah. yeah. And it's a reinforcement of the fact that if you're going to approach God, especially as a priest, as a high priest, the, the closer you get to God, the more careful you need to be. Uh, in the mm-hmm. Old Testament, you need to follow those precautions. You cannot be casual, uh, especially as a priest. Uh, in fact, even as the priest went into the Holy of Holies, he had a, a rope tied around his waist. Mm-hmm. He had bells at the bottom of his robe. And if those bells stopped ringing while he was in this most holy place, well, you knew he's gone and he had to be pulled mm-hmm. out under the curtain because he had been struck dead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah and nope. there, there are several kinds of deaths like that, like the guy who picks up sticks on the Sabbath and the guy so, who touches the ark. That's right. You know, but they were falling. doing that wrong to begin with. Yeah, they, right. there were there sure. are so many layers to all those sorts of things, and we're not to we're not to see God. I, I don't believe as this, you know, unreasonable punisher of silly sins. But these are people who are openly defying the law right. of God and openly disrespecting the holiness of God. So yes, and and also a lot of times these are like first instances. You know, here's an exemplary. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And Case. bringing judgment, kind of like Ananias and Sapphira to the early yeah. community in, in, in Jerusalem, where a severe judge, God doesn't do that for all people, but at the very mm-hmm. beginning, at the outset, there's a certain tone set about the uh, about how God is to be approached, how you're to uh, address these issues of lying, of greed, and so on. And so it's 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 sent, it's turns out to be an example for the community, and of course they're all in fear uh, because mm-hmm. of what had happened. So it was a very sobering moment in the early church. Yeah. All right, we're going to move on to some of the trickiest ones, I think, just for people today to understand. There's a whole section after that that talks about like clean and unclean. So I'm wondering if we can, I mean, we're going to get to like shellfish and women on their period and that kind of thing. But first, I wonder if you could help us understand there's a difference between sin and impurity. And I think we find those words both in the New Testament, but maybe we just have used them together so long that we don't understand there's a difference there. So maybe can you walk us through? that notion? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's good to uh, distinguish between the ceremonial or the ritual and the moral, mm. uh, that there, but there is overlap. So, you know, any sin is going to be defiling or render you polluted or defiled. Uh, but everything that, or something that defiles or renders you impure doesn't mean that it's necessarily moral or a sin or a transgression against God. Uh, so you have these different categories, uh, but but when it comes, to, let's just deal with the ritual, uh, you know, issues, uh, purity, impurity. Uh, well, this can be the result of coming into contact with a uh, dead animal. Uh, it can be the result of, of course, you know, um, you know. Well, semen and blood are images of life, powerful hmm. images in in the Old Testament, uh, and, and there were certain taboos that went along with. It, once, once the semen or blood went outside of the body, this was seen as ritually defiling. It was basically a move away from life within the body, 
toward death. Uh, and so that need made whole or repaired through various uh, you know, um, cleansings, purifications, and so on, uh, so that there could be a restoration to this whole, this kind of normalcy of life within the Israelite community. So it was, so again, if there is impurity through childbirth, if there's impurity through coming into contact with a dead animal that you stumble across, uh, well, you know, these can be easily repaired and restored through following these, uh, you know, the, the purification rituals that are, that are required. But again, the emphasis is on wholeness on, you know, like even a, a blemished animal, just like a blemished priest could not come before God. There's this emphasis on, uh, on, on wholeness uh, and, and, and normalcy of it within life. That was to be the example. It doesn't mean that people who, uh, you know, like I said, people who were richly impure were sinners, uh, you know, by virtue of becoming impure in this way. Uh, although the rituals themselves were to be reminders that the Israelites were to be God's holy people, is to remind them of their moral, the need for moral purity, and to set mm. themselves as, apart from the Gentile nations around them, that they were to be distinct. So when it came to, and again, I know we can perhaps uh, kind of cut to the chase on some of these things, you know, not wearing cloths, clothing mm -hmm. of different fibers, not planting two different crops in the same field, not putting two different animals together to, to, to plow your field. Uh, these, were, these were unlawful mixtures, as it were, to remind the Israelites, even in the basics of planting or clothing, uh, that they are to be God's people who are set apart and not mixed in with oh. the nations. So, okay. there is, so there is this reminder. And then this kind of carries over into the New Testament, where it's not ceremonial impurity, but it's moral impurity. And so you see that language of uncleanness. Uh, Paul in 2 Corinthians 6, uh, 17, talks about how you know, you're to come out from them, be, you know, be separate, and touch no unclean thing. So there's that reminder, not in a ritualistic sense, but actually in a moral sense, not to be morally compromised. And as Paul says in Ephesians, not to walk as the Gentiles walk. Uh, the Gentiles were seen as the non-Israelites, that is, the, is you know, the new Israel is the people of God, the inter-ethnic people of God from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And to refer to the Gentiles and refer to those who are outside of the mm. Christian faith, who are, and especially those who are walking in a kind of a pagan, immoral mm -hmm. mindset, not to compromise with them, not to engage in rituals that would uh, that would taint you uh, or compromise you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, I may be stealing from you on this, but as a kind of summary, I mean, when people think of Leviticus, they often go to the, oh, I can't eat shellfish and I can't eat pork. You know, there's lots of yeah. kind of jokes about that sort of thing. Right. But I have heard, and I know there's different theories about this. Some people say, oh, well, it's because pigs get worms or whatever, you know. Trichinosis, um, you don't want it. Right, but like every animal gets worms if yeah. you, you know, don't tend to it properly. Um, but but I think that I've heard that these are animals that, that live in mud. Like they're not dry land, but they're not sea either. You know, they're not fish or cows. They, they, uh, they're, there's a murkiness about their habitat mm. that's, you know, that that's not clean or unclean. Is that... Did you say that? Did I steal that from you in your your book, or um, or is that a theory that you agree with, or is it a hygienic thing, as people often will think? Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's not hygienic because keep in mind how Jesus later on says in 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 Mark uh, five, where he says that, or Mark seven, where he says that you know it's not what goes into a person that defiles that person, but what comes out of that person that does. Uh, and so the comment is that in saying this, Jesus declared all mm -hmm. clean. But uh, he's, not, he's not seeing anything that is inherently unhygienic here. Uh, so eating pork or bacon, you know, that's not the problem. It's not because there's some sort of a disease uh, or something that is associated with mud uh, that, is, that is problematic here. Uh, but rather, you know, you, you know with, whether it be pigs, you know, with their hooves uh, um, or other animals, there, there is what is the what tends to be the problem is one of two things. What differentiates the clean from the unclean when it comes to animals is one, you have this uh, kind of breaking of spheres. You'll have kind of a, a blending of two different types of spheres, like an eel, for example, is unclean. Why? 
Well, because it's it, even though it lives in the water, you'd think, well, it should, you know, it's like a fish, but it doesn't have scales. So that discounts it as being a pure fish. So it has a smooth skin rather than scales. So this means that it's kind of violating, as it were, this realm of the sphere that belongs to hmm. the fish. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the same thing goes with other animals that are sometimes bringing a combination of spheres together. Uh, or it could be that there are, say, predatory animals that are, that are, in a sense, unclean, like vultures or eagles that are, that are birds of prey. So it, it's, it's sending a message to the people of God not to be predatory, uh, you know, in terms of how you engage with others, etc. So I talk about some of these things in my book, Is God a Moral Monster? Uh, there's also the, the language of appearance and so forth that, uh, that I also include. But basically, uh, these foods are not unclean or impure in and of themselves, but rather it is a, these are, there are some, there's some symbolism associated with mm -hmm. them, but again, a reminder that these are things that are to, in your diet, remind you that you are the set apart people of God, that e even in what you eat, you're to be reminded that you are God's holy people. Uh, and again, that carries over to many other areas of life, but, but when it comes to diet, this is an example. All right, I have one more question while we're in this section, and then I think we're going to just breeze right through skin diseases because no one wants to talk about that. And I think we understand why that's in there. But in this section, um, well, we, we learn about like women on their period kind of going away, but we also learn that women are unclean for twice as long after they give birth to a female child than to a male child. So there's kind of two questions coming at you. One is, is God sexist? Um, no big deal, just a small question. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is, how do we know which ones of these laws we are supposed to still do today, right? I've had yeah. a baby, I've had two babies. One was a man, one was, he wasn't a man, he was a boy, and one was a girl. And everything was the same afterwards. You know, I didn't like stay away from church for longer when Charlotte was born. So why? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, there is some dispute on that. And again, we're not told why that is. Uh, some people say, wow, is the, is the, is the girl less valuable? than the boy. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there could be a, a couple or of more. reasons. Pardon? I said, or more. I mean, or she's yeah, exactly. twice as unclean, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, it, it could be, uh, some scholars will argue, that the this is a protection of females associated with ritual prostitution associated with worship in a lot of the surrounding nations that you know, sexuality was just part of the worship. And so it was making a statement that we're not bringing girls in right away. Uh, we're keeping them away a little bit longer than the men because of this perhaps sexual connotation that was so rife within these pagan temples or pagan uh, rituals within, within the ancient Near East. Um, also, there is a, you know, there's uh, some, some argument that there is a, uh, you know, that there is a kind of uh, bleeding that takes place when girls are born. So not only is the there a, 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 the 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 bleeding that comes with childbirth, but also sometimes there is a you know a a, a you know vaginal bleeding in the in the in the girl herself, and so that could lead to some have speculated that it could be this kind of double uh, in, impurity that that mm. uh, renders this condition kind of. Uh, kind of a double uh, uh, impurity. So it could be something along those lines, but it's not as though it's, it's sexist. Uh, you have uh, you, male and female made in the image of God. You have uh, honor your father and mother and, and in Leviticus, honor your, you know, honoring your mother and father. Uh, in fact, the mm -hmm. woman comes first. Uh, you have uh, women who are obviously strong leaders in the, the nation of Israel. Uh, and so it's not as though this is sexist. Uh, it's simply you know, there's some, sometimes there are murky reasons we don't always have access to, but those are a couple of possibilities. No, that's good. And I, I like that sometimes the answer is we're not quite sure. These are one of the many questions we get to ask God one day when we're with him. I mean, uh, but let's yeah. skip ahead because we are, man, who knew that Leviticus could be so fascinating. We're at 49 there minutes you already. Go. Yeah. Um, okay. So then there's a whole section on the day of atonement. Um, yeah. And I don't, I mean, you can say as much or as little as you want about the Day of Atonement, but I think one thing that we don't really talk about much in the church is the difference between there's like a scapegoat, and then there's also a sacrificial lamb. There's like right. two lambs or goats involved. 
maybe talk through what that means and how that will, you know, prefigure or point forward to Christ and sure. which one is he or is he yeah, both? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we do see a number of different things picked up on in these various images, um, you know, that you see, well, we'll take the day of atonement uh, specifically where you do have two goats. Uh, one goat is killed. Another goat is let go into the wilderness, the, the scapegoat. Um, now, there is kind of, there are complementary images here. Uh, one image has to do with the, the punishment that comes, again, representing the punishment, the, uh, the necessary atonement, uh, the covering of sin for the people of Israel that is uh, exemplified in this, uh, this killing of the goat uh, and offering it as a sacrifice. The scapegoat, by contrast, represents another image of sin, namely that this scapegoat is allowed to is set free goes off in the wilderness uh, as kind of bearing the sins of the people kind of taking them away from the land of israel so mm -hmm. this is as seen as a picture of yes there is a sin bearing that is going on here but it's just bringing it away from the people so there are complementary pictures of dealing with sin uh one is to uh to bring punishment to bring judgment you know, represented through the killing of the one goat and then there is a removal of that mm. uh you know kind of symbolically by bringing it out of the presence of the the community of israel uh sending it off into the wilderness so so and we see obviously jesus fulfilling uh, both of these but but of course the image of the lamb is associated with the passover uh so there is that uh, kind of added layer that we could we could also talk about but jesus of course is uh you know uh, second Peter or sorry first Peter 2 uh, that Jesus you know he bore his sins our sins in his body on the tree uh, that Jesus is the one who is the you know the one who takes our sins upon himself as a sacrificial victim uh, but there's also the uh, the image of the, uh, the the removal of sin too uh, the bearing of sin uh, kind of carrying our sorrows, uh, et cetera, as I, Isaiah 53 talks about. But even the even there, that is the image of the, the Passover lamb, uh, as opposed to, or in, in, in distinction from the scapegoat uh, that is killed. But anyway, that's a, a little bit of a, uh, an outlay of, of what's going on with the Day of Atonement. I like that. I mean, I, I think there's so much you could dig in and do a whole Bible study on this, but there is something for us about that there's when we do something wrong there's punishment but there also needs to be removal right this is uh this idea of repentance is moving away from something and trying to get that sin far away from us so i i like that yeah. um because How we have so little what, yeah I, I just say you know as you know like as you know, psalm 50 psalm 103 you know this is from the west so far has he removed our transgressions from us so mm -hmm. that 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 spatial language of, of removing it from uh from our presence well, and it's God that does it both times, right? Exactly. God yeah. sends his son to die, but he also is the one that removes our sin from us. I mean, I've, we partner with him in that, but he is the mover there, which is yes. really good news for us since we're bad at removing sin. Indeed. Um, okay. So we have two giant questions left to tackle before we're done. Um, we come out of the section about the day of atonement, and then we come into a list of rules about sexuality. I actually listened to, um, one of our local pastors here was talking about the fact that you people get so upset about you know that that's so sexually stifling but if you look at the rules most people even if you're very theologically liberal of those you know say 17 laws or rules about sexuality 15 of them they'll be like yeah yeah i agree with that you shouldn't have sex with your aunt or whatever like mm -hmm. you know they list them all out it's just Barnard the one or two that we have a problem with so but i'm going to ask you about the one that people uh you know, really recoil at when there are all these rules about who to not have sex with, who to not lay with. Um, in Leviticus 18, 22, it says, do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman that is detestable. So I'm going to ask you the very difficult question. Do you think God really is anti-homosexuality? And this is where we're going to lose or maybe gain listeners. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it is helpful to keep in mind what some people who have come out of gay relationships have actually said about finding wholeness hmm. uh, that uh, you know that when it comes of course the scriptures emphasize not the say inclination or quote orientation but rather the acts themselves and, and right. see that both in the old testament and the new uh when it comes to you know I, I think a lot of times we say oh what can't 
you mean I can't do this or I can't do that? Well, look at the structure that God has put into place and see if this makes sense. That when you look at how God has ordered sexuality, there's a natural complementarity where there is a mutual dependency of man and woman in, say, procreation. Uh, that there is, you know, and, and even some with, you know, spokespeople within the gay community will say, yes, you know, sexual pleasure is one thing, but child, bringing children into this, this is like um, and Andrew Sullivan talking about this, that, uh, that, you know, gay marriage is okay for couples, but it may not be in the best interest of children mm -hmm. uh, because you're necessarily depriving them of either a father or a mother within the home. And when you look at, uh, you know, um, um, Mark Regnerus of University of Texas at Austin has done a, a large scale study on looking at traditional two parent homes and, you know, of, of uh, sorry, of a father and a mother and any other arrangement, whether it be gay or lesbian couples, single parents, on every measurable scale, children do better with a father and a mother in the home. Without, say, a father in the home, uh, children are much more inclined to, to engage in, uh, you know, criminal activity, uh, you know, illegitimate, uh, you know, illegitimate births and so forth. Uh, you know, you know and, and even somebody like, uh, I remember, I guess, Michelle Obama uh, was talking about how, you know, when she is complimenting her husband who's running for office, she said, you know, our girls need a daddy. Mm -hmm. And she would, you know, well, well, can't they do without one? Well, no, I think people see that there is a great benefit that comes with both a, a father and a mother. And so, so I think, Let's, when we look at these rules for sexuality, look at how God has ordered things, uh, that this is for our, for our benefit, for our blessing, for our wholeness, and that there are people who have actually come out of the gay community, and the Apostle Paul talks about this uh, in his own way in, in 1 Corinthians 6, where he talks about those who have engaged in homosexual relations, and he said, such were some of you, but mm. you, were, you were washed, you were sanctified, uh, mm. you were justified. Uh, you know, that they had engaged in this, but they also found a better path. They found another way. And so it's not so much God is anti this or that, but God is pro mm. these things that actually enhance human flourishing. And he wants us to stay away from those things that actually could detract from it, could diminish uh, the, the, the way that he has called us to live. So, uh, you know, I can, I can go into a lot more detail here. I've written about some of these things in my book, When mm -hmm. God Goes to Starbucks and, and elsewhere. Um, but, but perhaps, I don't know, if you wanted to pursue that further, we could. No, I, I think that's a great, I mean, for the sake of we're trying to survey an entire book, we obviously aren't going to climb into each, you know, issue. But, I mean, as a single mom, I completely agree with what you're saying about uh, the, the best flourishing, the best blessing is doing things the way that God set up to begin with this, a man and a woman and a dad and a mom. Um, okay. So that was the first tricky question. The last tricky question, but I don't know, Evan might have some more is so then the, so we get through all of the kind of the sexual uh, rules, then there's just some various other weird rules, but we kind of talked about that already, the doubling up of fabrics and these kind of things and the animals and and you kind of spoke to that already, but it talks about festivals and rules for festivals. And then in, I don't even have which chapter this is, but toward the end of the book, there is this section about slavery that so many people are upset about. So I'm going to read it. And then I would love for you to just respond about is God sanctioning slavery. It right. says you, your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you from them. You may buy slaves. You may also buy some of the temporary residents living among you and members of their clans born in your country, and they will become your property. Yeesh. You can bequeath them to your children as inherited property and can make them slaves for life, but you must not rule over your fellow Israelites ruthlessly. Okay. That's a hard pill to swallow. Help us understand why that would be in there and, and why God would be saying yeah. that. Right. Well, one, the term slavery is often emotional laden, we think of modern slavery and the abuses that go with it, Uncle Tom's Cabin, the South, and so forth. And it is a much more, it, it's a neutral term in the Old Testament, hmm. uh, that this is a, basically, it's a dynamic dependency relationship. Uh, one is working for another. Uh, and in the book of Exodus, for example, uh, the Israelites are slaves 
servants of Pharaoh. In fact, the Egyptians themselves are called servants of Pharaoh or slaves of hmm. Pharaoh. But God, you know, the term work or serve is, you know, is the word that's that's being used here, you know, avad or eved, the word servant. Um, you know, God tells Moses to tell Pharaoh to let my people go that they may, what, serve me in the wilderness. So they're going from one servitude, which is awful, to another servitude, which is liberation. Hmm. So, mm -hmm. so we ought to think in, in a more neutral term. Uh, Joshua and Moses are called the, the Evet Adonai, the servant of the Lord. Uh, it's, a, it's an honorific title. Uh, when you look at, say, a, a passage, when you look at, say, servitude in the Old Testament, um, it's indentured servitude, typically, uh, that you have those who are working for a set amount of time, that they are, they have all the rights that go along with being an Israelite, for example, but yet they are impoverished, and so they will, quote, sell themselves or contract themselves out, like a person sells himself to the army for a certain number of years, so he's contracted out for the, to serve in the army. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same sort of contractual arrangement, and, and you can't break that until you're, uh, until that six-year period is done, for the Israelites. So it's indentured servitude. If a if a an employer or quote master hits a servant so that he dies, then that ma that master or employer is to be is to be capitally punished. So the, the servant in Israel has rights. Uh, even if you knock out his you know eye, you know, or gouge out his eye, knock out his tooth, uh, then the servant was to go free without any debt because he was injured. Again, this doesn't sound like uh, you know the anti antebellum South here. Um, so I guess the knocking out of the tooth does put another spin on indentured servitude. Oh boy. Uh, ooh, we knew we were going to get a dad joke, but you there went you almost to the end. Almost good. to the end. Had to, had to bring him here. So, so when it comes to, uh, to Leviticus 25, and, and again, we can, we can go into a lot of detail here. Keep in mind that just before you get to Leviticus 25, you have in chapter 19, it says you are to love the alien in your midst. In fact, alien or runaway slaves could come to Israel and we're allowed to settle in any of Israel's cities. So Israel is to be a refuge for those who are running away from harsh masters. So are we talking about, oh, you can be harsh masters here? No, I mean, we need to read it in its broader context. A lot of times this is taken out of context and totally distorted. Uh, so let's unpack this text just a little bit more. So one, Leviticus explicitly commands to love aliens, the same term that's used here of those aliens. Uh, that, uh, you know, so in fact, repeatedly we see that those who are foreigners in Israel were to be regarded with special care because these could be most easily taken advantage of and marginalized. So the orphan, the alien, the widow, you're to be on the lookout for those people in your midst. Also, uh, notice that it's, it's saying that you may acquire them. Well, how do you acquire them? Sometimes it's through warfare. Sometimes people migrate there looking for, uh, you know, they're escaping from, say, famine conditions, just like Abraham went to uh, to Egypt or Philistia uh, to to go in those in those areas because of the harsher conditions where they had been. So so then it says that you are to uh, you you can acquire them. Well, what does it mean to acquire them? Well, this is simply a legal terminology. Uh, for example, Boaz acquires Ruth as mm -hmm. his wife in this legal transaction. But clearly you see that she is a very strong woman, someone who is very uh, attentive to responsibility. She's an equal, you know, she's an equal player uh, in, in what's going on in, you know, along with Boaz and, and also Naomi. Also, it's interesting that this language of acquire is used of God rescuing the Israelites from Egypt, that he acquires them, he redeems them mm. in, in Exodus 15. That same word, kana, is used there. So it's, a, it's kind of a legal covenantal act of, uh, in this case, of, of acquisition. Uh, Eve says, I've acquired kana, uh, a man-child with the help of the Lord. Uh, so also, as we go on, notice that, you know, it talks about the, the stranger and alien, the stranger and alien throughout this text. Uh, but it goes on to say, that the, the alien, keep in mind, the alien could not acquire land in Israel. So basically, you're called, you're, you're, your only option is to attach yourself to an Israelite home. And because you can't acquire land in the next generation either, you are going to be, by necessity, dependent upon an Israelite family. So that's why you have them going from one generation to another within the same household. And as John Golden Gay says, servants were part of the household within mm -hmm. Israel. They were sharing in life together. So it wasn't as though they were, you know, you sit over at that table and, and you no, know, they were incorporated into the life of the family. Notice mm -hmm. also 
that when it comes to the, the, um, this language, it goes on to say that the alien and sojourner, they can become persons of means within Israel. So those same people, the same label that's used for those who are, can be acquired, they themselves can become independent, even to the point of being able to acquire an Israelite for themselves. Hmm. That same word, kana, is used of an Israelite. And so, obviously, it's not optimal for a foreigner to be able to acquire an Israelite. So that's why uh, a relative should try to redeem him, to buy, to buy him out of his debt. Um, and so it's referring to the Israelite later on in that chapter to, you know, that the Israelite has been acquired. Well, is the Israelite property? Well, clearly not. But the same terminology is being used, you know, possession, uh, as, as it is of this, uh, of this foreigner. So again, we're not talking about property. Sometimes we're simply talking about someone who is a legal, you know, who legally belongs to another person, but to diminish that person, say, oh, that person's not an image bearer, that person has no rights and so forth, that is a far cry from the broader vision of the Old Testament. So, so that I think brings a lot of a lot into context as we look at this year of Jubilee. That is the particular focus, uh, but we don't see actually a, a mistreatment of foreigners. We simply see that they can be incorporated into these households. They can, you know, again through warfare, through uh, famine conditions elsewhere, uh, even through run, being runaway slaves to being able to settle in some of these places. That's how they can come into these lands. So it's not as though there's kidnapping going on. Kidnapping was punishable uh, by, mm -hmm. by, you know, it's capitally punishable and so forth. So, and, and I argue in my book, Is God a Moral Monster, that if the provisions within the law of Moses that you don't kidnap, uh, you, 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 you bring runaway slaves into the land of Israel because they're leaving harsh conditions, uh, that you make provision for slaves, so that they don't, for those who are poor, so they don't have to sell themselves into slavery. Uh, and, and, and finally, you know, that there are gleaning laws that you can pick from trees and crops that haven't been fully harvested to help the poor of the land so they don't have to enter into servitude. There are certain concern, there's a certain concern for those who are the most vulnerable in society. So we, you know, rather than saying, oh, we can take advantage of these people, no, aliens mm -hmm. were to be cared for. They were most easily, uh, you know, would be one of the more, one of the groups most easily taken advantage of in Israelite society, in, in any society. And so God has a special concern and he reminds the people of Israel, remember that you too were once aliens in the land of Egypt. Yeah, man, you just gave in a few minutes, I think chapters of mm -hmm. a couple of your books. So um, podcast listeners, you're getting this for free. That's amazing. I don't yeah. think you realize, but you for had sure. another question. Well, we'll close on this because I know we're, we're out of time, but I tithing is a, a, an issue that comes up in the modern day church a lot. Sure. And some pastors will talk about it like it is a requirement in the law. I don't remember mm -hmm. if it's in Leviticus or not. I know Malachi 310 mentions tithing. I know Melchizedek gives 10% of his things to Abraham, mm -hmm. but right. What do you say? Is tithing a, a an ongoing law between the covenants for Christians, or is it something that's been fulfilled? Hmm. Yeah, uh, I would say it's been fulfilled. I mean, Jesus does mention tithing. You tithe your mint, dill, and cumin, you know, Matthew 23. Um, and he says, you know, go ahead and do this. I mean, it's sort of like, yeah, that, that's fine to carry that out. But you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, you know, like mercy and justice and so forth. So, so Jesus is mentioning it. But when we look at the actual model for giving, I think the place to look is in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, where the model is no longer the Old Testament and the tithe, but actually the incarnation of Jesus Christ, who, though he was rich, for our sakes became poor, so that we, through his poverty, might become rich, uh, obviously spiritually here. And so you know, the example is given in 2 Corinthians 8 of the Macedonians who gave out of their poverty, they gave more than they could afford. Uh, and, and, and that's exactly like Jesus, giving with generosity, giving uh, till it hurts. Uh, and, and so I think this serves as something of, and I think an important model for us to be self-sacrificial givers. And I think sometimes for, you know, within our own day, a tithe for some people could be very, very sacrificial, but for others, it could be just, oh, like, you know, pocket change. Uh, so, so we, I think going back to the, the your, your, your two turtle doves, uh, Sarah, um, you know, for some, you know, yes, for some people, 
you know, there are there is a great sacrifice even in giving those turtle doves. For others, mm -hmm. that's really nothing. Uh, you know, giving a tithe may be nothing. It may be very significant. Maybe a large, you know, it may be a very uh, maybe a step of faith for those people to give when when they're really giving a lot and, and can't afford much else. So those are a few insights I think that are helpful that we don't see the tithe. Uh, mentioned, but we see, we look to Christ as our example for giving, of self-sacrifice, uh, and thinking about the broader needs of the kingdom of God, and uh, letting that gauge how we how we use our resources. And it could be, it doesn't have to be financial, it could be how we use our time, mm -hmm. uh, how we, whether we open up our homes to people, and, and invite them into sharing our life. I mean, that can be a great sacrifice. Uh, people who live in your midst, people to whom you're giving, people try, you're trying to help out, there could be a lot of emotional energy expended, uh, you know, Give, giving meals for people and so forth. So there's there's a lot uh, to be said about different ways in which we can show that kind of sacrificial spirit. It's funny, you know, we think about Leviticus being so um, kind of harsh with all these rules, but then you just elucidated the same thing that happens when Jesus starts saying, you remember how it was this? Mm -hmm. Well, now it's this. Mm -hmm. Paul Copan is over here going, you heard it was a 10th. Now I want you to give till it hurts, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe Leviticus isn't as bad as we thought. And I'm hoping that in our conversation today, if you're listening, that maybe it's a little bit more accessible or a little bit, um, less harsh and you can see that there's there's good reasons behind so much of what's said there and it's a part of explaining god's holiness and where we fit in the system so paul thank you so much for coming on if people want to find out more about you i mean obviously all of your books are um able to be purchased and oh by the way if people want to give till it hurts not only buy paul's paul's books lots of them but you can also give to us we will gladly take your money theology Hopefully. on air theology on tap yeah Feel Not free to personally uh, in our ministry. Well, yeah. this guy's going to burn part of your money, but if well, you give it to yeah. Theology on Air, I'll make sure nobody burns any of it. But, um, but Paul, if people want to contact you and I don't know, yell at you for things you said today or ask you more questions, where can people find you? Uh, well, they can find me uh, through paulcopan.com, my website, and uh, that's, that's probably easy. the best way to go. And um, yeah, and if they're interested in my books, they're all available at, all available at Amazon. So, uh, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, ha have at it. We will. And for those of you wanting to get in contact with us, of course, you can find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Theology on Tap Houston, or go to our website. I'm very proud of our website, houstontot.com. Um, and uh, as always, we want you to, you know, go subscribe to the podcast, review it, rate it, love it, whatever, give money apparently till it hurts. Um, but until we do this again and we unpack another book of the Bible, we encourage you as always to question freely, think deeply, and disagree as needed.